Oh my, look at this. I thought everybody would get lost on the way to town hall. They would think it was someplace else. But I guess that all these, this new uh, technology lets you find your way. Thank you so much for coming out. I believe that the spirit of West Coast resistance is alive and well in Seattle, Washington. People say to me, you know, oh, you're just preaching to the converted. Well, I've been looking at the polls. If we get any more converted, it's going to be all of us. Uh, we have a very dark moment in this country. It's a very complicated and ugly and difficult time, which is exactly what I like. Because I like to go in and tear this stuff apart, get to the heart of it, and hopefully, hopefully figure out how we can most effectively resist that which is by its nature, not by, not by you know, some rhetorical reality, not by some you know, theory, by its nature, destructive and evil. And we need to name it as such. So if you're uncomfortable with that, stick around anyway, we'll say something else you like. So I know you folks are saying, you folks are saying, Mr. Nichols, why do we need another book about these Trump folks? I mean, really, seriously. I mean, I, I, I realize that it's been on television a bit of late um, and on Twitter, which I think Trump has kind of wrecked Twitter, hasn't he? Um, although, I, did you see this that, uh, you know, you remember the woman who was in the great battle with Cheney? Uh, over, she was a CIA analyst and, and right, of course. Right? She's trying to raise enough money to buy Twitter so she can knock Trump off it. <laughs> I'm torn about that because as a freedom of speech person, I, you know, I, I kind of don't want to you know, stomp. I don't want to stomp on his free speech rights, but I, I do like the idea that there could maybe be a warning. So let me tell you a little bit about this book. I started writing this book in February of 2016. In February 2016, I wrote a, a cover story for The Nation titled, President Trump, It Could Happen. And it, my argument was that if you actually got out of Washington and television studios, if you went out across America, what you would find is that a, a series of developments over the last 20 years had made a substantial portion of the electorate so embittered, so terrified about the future that they were open to appeals that, that historically would have been un, unimaginable, at least in modern times. Who would have thought, well, that, that couldn't happen? And what I heard when I went out and talked to union leaders, to elected officials in places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, all the states that eventually became very relevant to the year, is, was, you know, this Trump guy's doing way better than you expected. And one of the things that they said again and again was that, he's figured the Republican Party out. Now, I'll admit, that's not hard. Now, you want to take a lot of rocket scientist stuff. All that Donald Trump did was take a look at the Republican Party and say, oh, I get what's going on here. Small group of rich guys get together and hire consultants and messaging people and pollsters, and they figure out how to get a larger group of middle class to lower middle class, sometimes even working class people, to vote Republican, often based on issues of race and gender and abortion and LGBTQ rights and a host of other things, promising them that you know, somehow you will make America great again, and, and then actually using the power that is extended to the Republican Party to lower taxes for the rich guys. And what Trump did was very, very simple. He just wedged himself between the base and the rich guys, and he said, hey, I'm a rich guy. I know I've traveled in their circles, and they're lying to you. And all of the grassroots Republicans are like, yeah, that makes total sense. And so they nominated Trump for president of the United States. And that was not a hard thing to figure out at the time, although I, I'm going to unfortunately uh, shed my visionary claim because as the fall campaign started going, I talked myself out of the belief that Trump could be president. I was like, this, this is really hard to imagine that this guy could become president of the United States. It, 
it, it would require an incredible sort of like weaving of our political uh, structures. You'd have to win the Electoral College by an incredibly narrow margin in a handful of Midwestern states and actually lose the popular vote by, I don't know, three million. And, you know, that seemed very hard until it happened. But one thing, the reason that I say this book started back in February of 2016 was that I, as I looked at, at Trump, there was one thing that was absolutely 100% clear to me. He knew nothing about governing. And I don't mean nothing like nothing like, you know, I, George Bush knew nothing about governing, George W. I, I, no, I mean he knew nothing. He had never been actively involved in anything akin to mainstream politics. And I'm often a big critic of mainstream politics, but there's one value that comes from it in, in that you actually, if you get elected, say, I don't know, President of the United States, you know people that you can put into positions of power. You at least have some sense of the play. Donald Trump lacked that. He had no idea, and it was very obvious in February of 2016, it was very obvious in November of 2016 that this guy didn't know how to govern. And as a result, the people he empowered, the people he gave authority to, would govern. And they would define the future of the United States. And it's not, this is not to diminish Trump. I'm not one of those people who says he's stupid. I'm not one of those people who says that you, you know, we should not read his tweets anymore, anything like that. I think we should pay a lot of attention to Donald Trump. The man is a dangerous, scary figure who is trying to divide us. And if you don't pay attention to that and you let him speak only to his base or only to a portion of society, that's much more dangerous than Donald Trump would be in and of himself. So I think we should pay a lot of attention to the guy. However, I don't think we should assume that if Donald Trump has a bad day, if Donald Trump says something stupid, if Donald Trump tweets something absurd, and we say, well, mark that day against Trump, mark that day against this administration, that's a big mistake. Because if Donald Trump went to sleep from now until the end of his presidency, if he didn't tweet, if he didn't even watch Fox News, if he did nothing at all till the end of his presidency, this would be the most destructive administration in American history. And that is the point of my book. That is the point I want to make to people. I think the resistance is beautiful and good. There's some women in the back row there with their rise up and resist t-shirts. And I love the fact that they're, you know, yes, we should be wearing it all, right? This is good stuff to resist this. But what I want to say is we have to expand that resistance. We cannot let it be narrow and Trump focused. It cannot be Trump obsessed because if it is, then we might well end the Trump presidency following the impeachment, uh, but we might well end the Trump presidency following an impeachment, a resignation, his defeat in an election, and look back and say, wow, his approval ratings are very, very low. He uh, didn't really pass a lot of legislation. You, know, you run down the list of things that the pundits on TV talk about, right? And then only when you step back from it in the way that Howard Zinn taught me to look at history, only when you step back in the way that Noam Chomsky, I think, taught us all to look at our politics, only when you step back would you see, oh my goodness, Trump was a quote unquote failure who supercharged the military industrial complex and as it had never been supercharged before, who deconstructed our domestic programs, who undermined our access to health care, to housing, to transportation, and in a period when we should be restructuring our economy to be dramatically fairer, made it dramatically more unfair. If that's what happens, we lost. We lost badly. And we lost more badly than just having Donald Trump in the White House.
I hope I'm not bumming you out. <laughs> hope I'm not. Yeah, yeah, I know. I realize. And, and so I want to explain just quickly a little bit about how Donald Trump pro- chose the people that he put into power. And this is a big deal because we often think that there's a Svengali guiding Donald Trump. Many, a handful of you probably had it in your, you know, you're, you're like strong people, solid people, people who bike uphill. So last night you were able to watch Steve Bannon on 60 Minutes. And, and, and where he revealed he is, in fact, everything that he has said that he is, right? And, and he was not dishonest about this. He wasn't un, unrealistic about this. He was very, very clear in who he is and what he is all about. And yet to think that Steve Bannon is the guide to this administration, that he is the only defining figure, misses the point of everything that's going on. Donald Trump knows very, very little about governing. Donald Trump knows very, very little about politics as we traditionally understand it. Now that doesn't mean he wasn't smart enough to win the Republican Party over or even the presidency, but what it does mean is that he had to turn to a lot of people very quickly to begin to establish an administration. Bannon's influence has been and will continue to be, don't think for a second he's gone. Bannon's influence has been and will continue to be philosophical. Bannon is a super smart guy. He is always the smartest guy in the room. Now, weirdly enough, in the Trump administration, Donald Trump is often the most reasonable guy in the room. And so what you need to understand is that being smart, being reasonable, being the adult in the room is not necessarily a good thing. But it is important to understand that Bannon's influence on this administration is a theory of, how the, of what the Republican Party ought to become. And that is a nationalist party that weds a, both social conservatism and economic conservatism around a fantasy, a fantasy that you can make society better for a handful of people, right? And that that handful of people, just enough to vote Republican and elect them, will move this thing forward. It is a very ugly, very divisive politics, rooted, and Bannon's very honest about this, rooted in Andrew Jackson. And and I, I don't know what you learned in school, but Andrew Jackson wasn't a good guy. I mean, he was a really nasty person. He was a slaveholder who, uh, forced Native Americans off their land. I mean, you can just run down the list of things that Andrew Jackson did as President of the United States, and what you realize is that it was all about dividing the American people, and it's interesting, he had one group of people that he was really good with, and that was, or you know, really got along with, well, that was white guys. And in fact, at that point, you'll note that in much of the country, the only people that could vote were white guys. And so it worked pretty well there, you didn't have to do a lot of voter suppression because you just didn't allow most other people to vote. But now we're in a different game. And so the Bannon influence, the Bannon influence, philosophical, media, and I think very much in the area of voter suppression. And in the book, I write about Bannon quite a a bit, but I also write about Chris Kobach, the guy who heads Trump's election oversight commission, this voting commission that's been established. And at the bottom, the bottom of this whole thing, what you have to understand is these people know that a lot of what they stand for isn't all that popular. They are going to try to make it much harder to vote. And if we don't pay attention to Chris Kobach, then we are not doing serious due diligence on this administration. So that's a roundabout way of taking you down from one level to the next level and urging you to keep on going through it. And with that, I'm going to talk about Betsy DeVos. <laughs> Woo! Oh my gosh! It, it, she's the Secretary of Education! I know, this is an un, unimaginable moment. I live in a country where Betsy DeVos is the Secretary of Education. And, and Scott Pruitt is in charge of the Environmental Protection Agency. And Jeff Sessions is in charge of a department that's named Justice. I mean, what you begin to understand is that every one of Trump's appointees has a, as their first responsibility making the name of the department that they had a lie, right? 
It, Scott Pruitt, environmental protection. No, they're not protecting. They don't want to protect the environment. Um, you know, Jeff Sessions at Justice. I mean, this guy has spent his entire career trying to avert justice, and he is continuing to do so. And again and again and again, you see people that are just in the wrong place. But I start the book out with Betsy DeVos. And there's a reason that I do that. Because Betsy DeVos, in many senses, is the only honest member of the Trump administration. And I'll explain why. She isn't really all that honest. She has, in fact, spent a long time trying to essentially knock the underpinnings out from underneath public education in America and come up with a way to shift the resources away from public education and toward private schools, experiments in, in all sorts of things that will only leave our children less well educated. However, there, was, there were a couple of magic moments in her confirmation hearing. One of which is where Betsy DeVos, who had spent you know, really most of her adult lifetime working in the area of education, and she was asked about some basic programs for people or children with disabilities and a host of other initiatives as regards education. Maggie Hassan, the, the senator from New Hampshire, asked about it. And she didn't know which programs were federal and which programs were state. I mean, literally, her ignorance was so scorching that it would have disqualified her, not merely from being Secretary of Education of the United States, it would have disqualified her from serving on a rural school board. I mean, this was really bad stuff. You would have, she could have been beaten in a school board race because you say she literally does not know which programs she would be dealing with and which she didn't. So that, that's really bad. But the honest part came later, toward the end of the hearing, when Senator Bernie Sanders, and I, you know, in fairness, I think it's sort of unfair to have Sanders on any committee that's analyzing a billionaire, because by the nature, he's going to actually ask pointed and useful questions, and that sort of blows up the whole Washington thing. But the other Washington, not Seattle. Um, and, and so Sanders is sitting there looking at her, and, and you could tell he had the question coming. You just, you saw it coming. He like goes slow and he goes, uh, this is DeVos. Hey, I don't want to be tough on you or too mean here or anything like that. But, you know, you're a major Republican campaign donor. In fact, you're one of the biggest Republican campaign donors ever. Um, you know, it's like the Koch brothers sort of look up to you for advice and counsel on how to do this stuff. And, and he didn't actually say that. That's a little bit of my filling in the blanks. But... Um, but he did say this, he said to her, he said, I just want to ask you, do you think you would be sitting before this committee right now being considered to be Secretary of Education of the United States if you and your family, which by the way includes Eric Prince of Blackwater fame, if you and your family hadn't given more than $200 million in campaign donations to Republican candidates for office, including members of this committee? Well, that's a mean question. Yeah, I mean, that's a, you know, it's kind of, it's almost like this stuff mattered. Um, and it's Betsy DeVos, to her immense credit, did not say, well, of course I should be in this position. I'm a former school board member. I've been on state boards of education. I've taught education at major universities. I've written great books and respected texts on education. She couldn't say any of those things because she hasn't done any of those things. She didn't even send her children to public schools. And so she answered by saying, I don't know, probably. <laughs> she actually said, you know, it's possible, you know, it could happen. And I thought to myself, well, there's a little bit of honesty. Even she knows she should not be in a position of authority over education in this country. The tragedy is that when she could not even answer that question in a way that would qualify her or open the door to her credibly serving in the position, the Senate of the United States approved her to serve as Trump's Secretary of Education. And the fact of the matter is, this is how Trump got these people. And this is an important thing to understand. Don't just blame him. 
There's a United States Senate. There's a system of checks and balances. There's separation of powers. And Mitch McConnell looked at all of that and he said, you know, I've really been t I'm really tired of having obstructed Barack Obama for eight years. Now I just want to give a president whatever he asks for. And the Senate collapsed as a functional check and balance on the presidency, as did the House of Representatives. I will go so far as to say we do not have a Congress at this point. I, it's tragic, and I don't say it casually, but if you think we have a Congress at this point, you're not paying attention. They literally get, are giving it away to Donald Trump, and they are doing so in ways that Democratic Congresses in the past did not give it away to Lyndon Johnson, that Republican Congresses in the past did not give it away to Ronald Reagan. Something fundamental has fallen apart in the body politic of our country, and that's another thing I write about in the book because we need to understand that. This is, this is a big shift that has occurred in our country. So that's one part, important part, of how these people got their positions. Let me give you one other explanation of how these people got their positions. And I, I don't know, because I know that you're Seattle people and you're really smart and good and noble. You come out on Monday night to events in halls like this and you know, you go to demonstrations and you elect socialists to your city council and, you know, I mean, come on, you're just like amazing. Um, so you may not have a lot of time to watch, the, may not have had a lot of time to watch the show The Apprentice. <laughs> but if you did, you would also know a great deal about how Donald Trump assembled his, you know, circle of grifters and, 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 you know, I mean, it's like, this is the biggest grifter convention that we've seen in modern times. But, but he came in not knowing who to put into positions of power and not trusting most of the people who traditionally would suggest nominees. So as a result, and this is not, you know, I, I wish I could tell you this is some secret I found out. It was actually on television. But do you notice, you know, we were all in such shock and, and busily preparing for the Women's March on January 21st, that we didn't actually watch kind of what happened in November and December. But Trump was at this like resort in, in one of his many resorts in, in New Jersey, and then also up at Trump Tower. And he had auditions. It was like The Apprentice. And they would have these people come in and make their case for why they should have control over agencies of the federal government that have bigger budgets than whole countries and that have more employees than whole states, right? I mean, these are really powerful jobs. The cabinet isn't, but is anybody here, by the way, just to interrupt as we will get right back to this. Does anybody know how many cabinet members George Washington had? Wow. And I was so impressed that she said, I just heard you on the radio talking about it. But <laughs> she did. It's okay. Does a teacher mark you down just because you listened in class? I don't think so. <laughs> so that's right. George Washington had four. We knew, we knew who they were. We, we make Broadway plays about them, right? I mean, it's, it's very easy to kind of keep track of these guys. Now... We have 15 you know, major agencies, uh, and then you have the ability to expand the cabinet by bringing in you know, like some bunch of generals and other folks. And so you, know, you get up to around 20 or more people in the room at any given time. There's a lot of folks. It's way too many for Donald Trump to keep track of. In fact, at one point he was introducing Betsy DeVos, and he clearly forgot what job she had. <laughs> And he was like, here's Betsy, uh, and she's at uh, education. And, I mean, it's kind of painful to watch the thing, but this is the reality. He didn't know. There's no way Donald Trump knew all the cabinet posts. There's no way that Donald Trump going in uh, had any sense of who he's going to put in these jobs. So, literally, aides would say, Jared Kushner would walk in and say, oh, we need, you know, we're going to have to get ourselves a secretary or I." He probably did say secretary of the EPA. It's actually administrator. But anyway, we've got to get somebody over at the EPA. And so they bring people in. They literally came up to meet, right? And there's simply no question. It's the apprentice. 
You got the job if you yelled loudest, if you were the loudest yeller with the widest eyes. If you really had what Trump is always looking for, passion for the job, he gave it to you. And so our Secretary of Education, our Secretary or Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency is in fact a guy who sued the Environmental Protection Agency 14 times and literally was the leading critic of the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. Now to Donald Trump, that's somebody who knows a lot about the EPA. But that's not, even a conservative Republican wouldn't choose that person to be in charge of it. It's madness. It, it, it isn't even a good deconstruction of the agency. It's such a ripping and tearing that it makes what it might still have been a functional agency but more conservatively run literally go into chaos. I met, when I was working on the book, I talked to people who worked in all these agencies and they told stories. One young man who's, by the way, don't ever hate the agency beneath the top level. There are all these people who've committed their lives to government and ma mainly came to agencies because of their passion for the environment, for justice, for whatever a different agency would do. And I met this guy, he said, he said, you know what I do all the time now, every day after work? I go to a retirement party for the best people in the agency, the senior people. Hundreds, thousands of years of experience are walking out of these agencies on a daily basis because they're being run in such a chaotic and dysfunctional and often destructive way that people just give up on it. And, and, they're not, and I don't fault them for it because I've talked to some of them and they say, you know, look, I would stay if I thought I could do good, but I believe that if I stay, I will be part of the machine that is literally dialing this thing down, that is literally making it into something more destructive. And so we lose people like Sally Yates over at Justice, right? I mean, we, we're losing genuinely experienced people who should be heading these agencies. And Scott Pruitt is there because he was the loudest yeller. The fact of the matter is, at agency after agency after agency, in position after position after position, you have people who literally screamed louder than the other people that wanted the job, or who were more corrupted, or who were, more, who were better grifters. And, and which brings us to Rex Tillerson. <laughs> this is the big, it, it, if there's nothing else in the book that you read, and if there's nothing else that you take away from it, um, and, I even, and I even acknowledge, you know, you don't have to read the Jeff Sessions chapter. It's horrifying. Um, although it does begin with, I think, the best line in the book. What can be said about Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III that has not already been said by Dr. David Duke? No, I spent a lot of time on right-wing and alt-right social media, and you got your, your sense of that. Um, this is really ugly stuff. There is a lot of racism. There is a lot of xenophobia. There are a lot of things that are terrifying in this administration. But to my mind, the most terrifying thing and the thing that, that ought to haunt us, and although, by the way, it's a fine holiday gift and it shouldn't scare you, and, <laughs> but, but the thing that ought to haunt us is what's happening with the military-industrial complex in this administration. And this is, a, this is an elaborate reality that you can only put together by looking at all the players and beginning to understand the role that they are playing. And Rex Tillerson's job is to destroy the Department of State. Now, I know he would not describe it as such, but the fact of the matter is that since he has come to the Department of State, Rex Tillerson has accepted massive budget cuts. He has not filled key positions. They have literally dialed down the diplomatic corps in ways that are unimaginable at this time in our history, and they're taking whole sections of the State Department, which by the way, literally deals with issues that, that many people don't even imagine. Techn global technology, whether net neutrality exists between countries and how these things work, with environmental issues at, at the most fundamental levels because, you know, the weird thing is that when the polar ice cap melts and the ocean rises, it doesn't just rise in America. It rises globally. And so the State Department is this really critical global and domestic entity and Rex Tillerson is guiding it literally as if he was a CEO who was sent in to downsize a multinational corporation. 
He is bringing in these kind of reorganization groups, corporate ones, to look at it and figure out how they can do more with less. And the fact of the matter is, I don't want my State Department doing more with less. They're the people that are supposed to, and I know it doesn't always work that way, they're the people that are supposed to come up with alternatives to war. They're the people that are supposed to have us interacting with the rest of the world in a functional way. They're supposed to practice diplomacy, but also to show us how to use foreign aid, ideally in good ways. And one final thing, they actually have experts who know about other countries, like, I don't know, North Korea. And, and so, as Tillerson downsizes this agency and seriously damages it, and by the way, I've Every, now it may not happen here, but when I've done events in D.C. and other places and I've talked about this, I have State Department people who are in the crowd who come up afterwards and they literally say, you were too soft on them. You don't know how bad it is. They talk to the same thing of the retirements, the massive number of people leaving. I've had ambassadors, outgoing ambassadors say, I volunteered to come to Washington to help my successor to make sure we had continuity and I was told, we don't need you. This, what's going on at the Department of State is terrible, and it is part of the building out of a military-industrial complex. And this is a big deal. Everybody says that the generals that Donald Trump has put in positions of power, and I profile all the generals, read their books, looked at all their background, then I say, well, they're the adults in the room. Well, with all due respect, just being an adult doesn't qualify you to be in charge of the strongest military in the world. And just does it, you know, there are some adults who are actually wrong about things. And some of these adults in the room, like McMaster, who everybody said, oh, he's a very responsible guy, very you know, decent guy. McMaster wrote a book about the Vietnam War, in which, which was well received by our punditocracy, in which he said, you know, the military listened too much to the civilians. We were too concerned about domestic politics and domestic affairs. You know, you get in a war, you go in to, to win, right? And the fact is, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that that lack of nuance is exactly what we need around Donald Trump at this point. And Mattis, I will tell you, right, no question about it. There's absolutely no question in my mind that the reason that Donald Trump chose General Mattis to head the Pentagon was because his nickname is Mad Dog. I mean, Trump can't resist himself. Anytime he mentions the guy, he's always like, the Mad Dog, he's a Mad Dog. They call him Mad Dog. And Trump loves that, right? I mean, it clearly excites the heck out of him. Now, the truth is, General Mattis is a smart guy, capable guy, respected military leader. But he also has the name Mad Dog for a reason. And when you begin to explore his record, what you realize is that much of our media describes someone as an adult in the room if they are willing to use military power in situations where a lot of people might not. And so we have created a situation where we've dialed the State Department down and dialed the Pentagon up. And I'll circle around as we finish off here with my part, and then we'll talk to, let you folks ask the really smart questions. Brings us to Mick Mulvaney. Does everybody know who Mick Mulvaney is? If you don't, that's okay. But I know, I know a few hands go up. I know some people don't like to raise hand in class and stuff like that. But Mick Mulvaney is the director of the Office of Management and Budget. The OMB director, he's a budget guy. He comes up with Trump's budget. And the thing about it is, before he was that, he was generally thought of as pretty much the kookiest guy in the House of Representatives like the loudest yeller, once again. And you're sort of like, how did Mick Mulvaney, like it's from down in the Carolinas, who didn't even back Trump for president, end up in charge of making basic budget decisions, usually doing the balances where we make these things work. And then you realize, okay, oh, he was, he was a grifter real estate developer. Literally, I write in the book about it. He like, like was selling swamp land, they were developing swamp land down in the Carolinas. And I'm sure when he met, went to meet with the president, they found some common ground. But the fact of the matter is, Mulvaney is a guy who is in, on the kind of extreme end of the Freedom Caucus in the House of Representatives. He loved the idea of shutting down the government. He despised government. That is not the best person to have in charge of the budget, right? 
I mean, even if you're a conservative, unless you really want crisis upon crisis, you don't put them there. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at the budget that Mick Mulvaney came up with, he proposes taking tens of billions of dollars out of domestic programs. And remember, the budget is the moral document of any administration. It also is the Rorschach test. It tells us really where this administration is. They propose to take tens of billions of dollars out of domestic programs and move it directly to the Pentagon. We're dialing down the Department of State, not filling key positions, literally, literally abandoning diplomacy. We're filling our key military positions with generals who are some of the, who people who just have a, a record, whether you like them or not, whether you agree with them on everything or not, and you can even respect them as generals in some cases, but have a record of believing that the military should be supercharged and massively funded, more so than it, the, the most expensive military in the world should be more expensive and be bigger. And then you have a budget director saying, you know, we're gonna steer everything we can, every opening we get, every compromise that we do will be aimed at dialing down domestic programs and moving money to the Pentagon. This is scary stuff. Mick Mulvaney actually criticized Meals on Wheels because he said, you know, Ray, it's got a good reputation, but you know, do they really feed the old people that well? And, well, the answer is yes, they do. It's an incredibly efficient program that gets very, very little federal money, just like public broadcasting and all sorts of other things. But this guy wants to, to gut these things out so that there's more money for the Pentagon. There was a poster some years ago that showed a little girl. And she's looking up at the camera, and she says, Mama, the president says I have to give my lunch money to the generals because they need more guns. That is the basic premise of what is happening within the Trump administration, not wholly because Donald Trump even understands or frankly focuses on these issues, but because the people he has empowered are running this train. And every day, no matter what Trump is tweeting, no matter what Trump is, you know, what he's saying, if he cuts a deal for a minute with Chuck Schumer, the fact is these things continue on a daily basis. And the hero of my book is not some radical. Well, actually, the hero of my book is those who are resisting. I dedicate the book to my mother, who, if I could just give you a, my mother's story. She's 87 years old. She lives in Burlington, Wisconsin. And I was on, like, the second day of the tour, and, and one, of my, one of my mom's friends texted me. And whenever one of my mom's friends texts me, you know, she's 87 years old. I'm like, oh, my gosh, there may be something, you know, immediately. What's up? What's up? And, they, and the text was, your mother is at it again. <laughs> and it was a picture from Racine, Wisconsin, outside the courthouse with my mother in her red cape, surrounded by members of Voces de la Frontera, our Hispanic and Latino rights group, immigrant rights group, as they protested against the DACA order. And so, that's where I come from. But actually, the weirdly enough, the hero of my book, the hero of my book is Dwight Eisenhower, who's not a radical. But Dwight Eisenhower, I believe the function of, of Donald Trump's presidency and the function of the people that he has empowered is to cause us to recognize the vulnerabilities in our system. The Electoral College, created in slave times, designed to prevent the people's will from dominating, from, from guiding things, made Donald Trump president. He lost the popular vote at, by three million votes. In most countries in the world, he wouldn't be president. That is a vulnerability. Another vulnerability is cabinet-style government as it has developed today, with limited oversight and massively powerful agencies that can literally make orders and do things without any check and balance on them, or with very limited checks and balances on them. So I wrote this book to, to get people to focus there and understand that, that we have to put a tremendous amount of our resistance energy into these areas. But Eisenhower becomes a hero because he warned us about these vulnerabilities, particularly as regards the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower gave two great speeches in his presidency. You all know about one of them, and that is the, the speech on the military-industrial complex, where he said, interestingly enough, that if you combine the military, with corporate power that is enriched by the expansion of the military, and this is the final part of it, not often remembered, with science and technology, 
which thus has it brings in the ability to define where we go in the future, which takes the energy of defining our future away from domestic concerns, away from human concerns, and over to how do we kill better, right? He said this, is, this could destroy the country. This could define the country in ways that will be absolutely terrifying. And he warned us about it. It was good, it was good advice and counsel. But the more amazing speech he gave was only a few months into his presidency in 1953. It was called the Cross of Iron speech. And he said as the most respected general in the world at that time, the guy who had literally beaten fascism, and in the midst of a Cold War, he said, I know there's a lot of people who say we gotta build up the Pentagon budget and do all this stuff. I just wanna tell you, every battleship that we build is a school that doesn't get built. Every weapon system that we spend money on is a housing project that doesn't get completed. Every military expansion, every new base around the world, every new big thing we do is a highway or a piece of infrastructure that we can't afford. The fact of the matter is that Dwight Eisenhower said, when you look at the balances of a federal government, you have to look below that overall budget figure and figure out where the money is going who is being empowered, where the resources will be. He warned us that if we didn't do that, there was a possibility that in the future, we would see an administration that would literally tip the balances against us. Not just to tip the balances toward war, but tip the balances toward a future in which the military industrial complex and its extensions were dominant in every sense. And that our domestic concerns, our domestic concerns for civil rights and civil liberties, for economic justice, for social justice, would be dialed down and undermined, not merely by a right-wing administration, but by the structural realities of that administration. Eisenhower pleaded with us to pay attention. My argument today is that it, we have reached the point he warned us about. We're there. The balances are dramatically off. And if we merely oppose Donald Trump, but do not dig deeper into this thing and oppose the people he has empowered and oppose the imbalance that is beginning to dominate our country, we run the risk of ending up with a future that is so radically at odds with what any decent conservative American would want. A Republican like Dwight Eisenhower would want. We run tremendous risks. And so our resistance must be deeper, smarter, and more passionate. And it also must be confident. We must recognize this is not the America we want. It is why they act so frequently in secret. It is why they try to distract us so often and in so many ways. Don't be distracted. Take your resistance to the points of power. Say no, not merely to Donald Trump, but to Jeff Sessions and to Scott Pruitt and to Betsy DeVos and to the generals and to Rex Tillerson and to all of those who would lead us into a Trumpocalypse. The fact of the matter is we can avert it, but we can only avert it with knowledge. Solidarity. And I'm going to take a curator's prerogative and actually ask the first question because I was terrified and inspired by your talk, John, and thinking a lot about the what you didn't quite say but seems like the, ter yeah. the most terrifying inevitable consequence of this, which is actual war in, during the Trump administration, mm -hmm. maybe in North Korea, maybe in Iran or Syria. Mm -hmm. I mean, war beyond the extent of the actual secret wars that are currently mm -hmm. undergoing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the coverage of that has looked at this kind of perverse balance of power in the administration where sometimes the Bannon true believer nationalists mm -hmm. are actually, for those of us who oppose war, are perversely our allies. So I wonder if you can comment on like the state of that balance of power and whether you see that angle on the, on the White House on these like the most fundamental questions of war and peace as a useful rubric of thinking about it. Yeah, I'll try to do that in a minute. <laughs> Um, look, here's the bottom line. I was never, ever comfortable with the notion 
that somebody who we said, well, yeah, he's kind of a racist. He's a xenophobe. He's seeking to divide us in ways that, that we should not be divided. Literally is dividing us against the future. But he's sort of anti-war, so he's kind of, it's okay, right? The fact of the matter is we need to have a Barbara Lee assessment of this situation. And we, this, today is September 11th. This is the 16th anniversary of the attacks on the Pentagon, the World Trade Center. And it is important to remember, so many political leaders lost perspective in that moment. Barbara Lee, the congresswoman from Berkeley and Oakland in, in California, but even then, even those, even that Berkeley and Oakland, almost to Seattle, right, was considered, it was, you know, it was considered incredibly dangerous to say no. Barbara Lee stood up and said no to authorizing the Bush administration to launch an endless war that has not ended even today. They operate under the same authorization of the use of military force. And Barbara Lee will also tell you that racial and economic justice are life and death, absolutely essential. So we can't, we gotta be very careful about trying to imagine we see some opening there with these folks. And I will lead it to one final thing. Nothing in Donald Trump's selections of people to empower causes me to believe that this is a more peace-loving or anti-war administration than any of its predecessors. I've been unsatisfied with all of its predecessors, right? It is, but what I'm telling you is, if you read the book, the people have been empowered, and the way that the money is flowing does not, does not inspire confidence. It actually, to me, I, I don't get scared by very much. Researching these people, talking to people at the State Department, and that, that really, that did daunt me. So I, I, I hope I, in, in a little over a minute, answered your question that don't, don't, there's simply no way you should put your, your confidence in Steve Bannon or Stephen Miller. They are not going to get us out of any trouble. They will get us into more trouble. Ma'am. Who, I think so, you, rode, you rode your bike. I, I did, yes. Did you ride uphill? Yeah, I did ride uphill. Here you go. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> so there's so many um, people in his administration that are essentially anti-government. And then, you know, the strong military ethos. It sounds like the guiding principle of like Fox News, Reagan misremembering of his presidency of, you know, what makes America great is a s extremely small government that lets you do essentially what you want and a strong military. I think over the years, they've been trying to work with that. So is there like a group of people kind of behind the scenes, behind Fox News, behind that, aside from Bannon, that's yes. kind of driving this ethos? Ask me, you know, like, okay, you got this big book, and there are more than 40 folks profiled in the book. Even Ivanka Trump, you have to do it. Her, her chapter's titled Complicit. Um, <laughs> but I, the first, I start the book out with actually a lot of history and a little bit of putting this in perspective. We need to know how powerful our, our cabinet level government, our regulatory government has been. We need to know that a driving principle of this is, the, is what Steve Bannon said, that is the deconstruction of the administrative state. They really do want to dial down regulations and protections. But I bring, begin the book with a, a section called Wicked Messengers. It's an homage to Bob Dylan. And the first Wicked Messengers are, are Robert and Rebecca Mercer. And the Mercers are, this is the interesting thing that, that they're not the only ones. I mean, in many ways, the answer to your question is, is uh, not a small group or a conspiracy at all. It's the Republican Party. And the fact of the matter is the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, has transformed itself into a political machine that puts victory in elections so far ahead any, of any other value that it's willing to literally sacrifice itself on the altar of Donald Trump. Right? And so there's, there's a bigger reality here. 
But much of what has made the Republican Party and the conservative movement into what it is today traces back to these wealthy donors. We know the Koch brothers. We're well familiar with them and Sheldon Adelson and some other folks. The Mercers are a little less known, although I'm in Seattle, so everybody echoes their name because you're very smart and engaged and read things. But here's the interesting thing about the Mercers that not everybody knows. Years ago, many years ago, they're like, it's Robert Mercer. He's an incredibly smart guy and an incredibly rich guy who somehow wasn't smart enough to figure out that you know, liberal democracy and humanity is a good thing. Um, and so his, his politics are extremely right-wing, sort of a mix of libertarian and authoritarian. How you mix those two, to, two together I know is difficult, but he does it. And, and some years ago he was looking for somebody to invest in, right? You know, where to put money to try and really start to shape our politics. And he met a young, scrappy whippersnapper named Steve Bannon. And uh, essentially the Mercers own Breitbart. They're the, they funded Breitbart for years. They funded all of Bannon's projects, including his documentaries, which, by the way, I watched in preparing the book. I watched them so you don't have to, but, I mean, this is... They really shaped out this fear politics and this politics of fearing immigrants and, and anybody who, who doesn't fit into this incredibly narrow immigrants, refugees, people of color, the list, you know, the list gets really long. And here's where... where it gets interesting because, so Bannon is somebody they've, they've funded for a very, very long time. There's one other person they funded for a very long time, a pollster, Kellyanne Conway. <laughs> and so what they did, when Manafort had to scramble out because he got in a little bit of trouble, right, the Trump campaign was without a leadership core. They had the family, but they didn't have people that knew politics. The Mercers, who had sort of essentially backed Ted Cruz for president, because uh, they saw, you know, his humanity and decency. And, um, <laughs> they got, they, you know, sit down with, with Trump, and they said, you know, we got a lot of money, and we can certainly be helpful here. We have some recommendations for staffing, if you're interested. And suddenly, Kellyanne Conway and Steve Bannon are put together as top people in this campaign. And the fact of the matter is that Bannon's determination to drive wedges of division uh, into especially those Midwestern states, combined with Conway's very skilled polling and her, amazingly enough, ability to speak to women, um, it, 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 proved to be, it proved to be very effective. And that, so there, is a, there really are people behind this thing. There really are players. They're not, it's not just them. Uh, but the way to understand it is people who transformed the Republican Party into something far more extreme than it has ever been, were also people who, at a critical point, got their hooks into this campaign and this presidency. And they don't define it. They're not, for the most part, recommending hires or recommending people for positions. Again, it is that philosophical drive. And, uh, and that is why I, I always say, because of the money that the Mercers have, tr tens of billions of dollars, uh, the money they have and the fact that they're backing Steve Bannon even now, means that he's not outside of this thing. He's, in fact, very much in it. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I'm going to give whoever's book I stole back. All right. Yes. Well, I'll probably knock you on your ear, but I'd like to tell you that I voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. And the reason being... Let's make sure... Yeah, you sound... Everybody can hear? Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, you sound good. It's good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go the reason being yeah. is that I felt over a number of years since the assassination of John F. Kennedy with the Warren Commission, that was a gosh darn lie, with uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King, the 9-11, uh, uh, what Johnson did to the USS Liberty, what he did with the Gulf of Tonkin, we have been like frogs in water, and they keep turning it up, turning it up, and turning it up. And I feel we are close to the temperature where we're going to start boiling. And that's the reason why I voted for Trump, because it brings us out of the, our living rooms, away from the sofas and the falseness of the TV crap that we watch all the time, the fake news, and we're on our feet, and we're out there marching, and we're out there doing things, instead of voting for Hillary when we'd have the neocons who wrote the Project for a New American Century, getting us into as many wars, the seven wars that we possibly can. 
okay? Uh, Do you think I am wrong for voting for Trump? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, can I first off say, can I first off say, she's, she seems to be a very competent, solid well, uh, woman, and, and I've had at a number of events, uh, including at Politics and Pros, the first event of the tour out in Washington, individuals who stood up and said, I voted for Donald Trump. And um, they've had different reasons for doing so. I think for those of us who believe in a democracy where we have real discourse, I thank you for coming. And I thank you for getting up and saying that. No, I mean, it's a, no, I'm serious. It's a, yeah, yeah, no, I'm gonna answer your question. But what I'm saying is, it's, it, it, it's and I also thank you for listening to her question, right? And taking it in, and, and this is something that I think a lot of our, our friends on the right don't imagine is possible. They don't imagine somebody could come up and say, I voted for Donald Trump, and people want to listen. They want to hear why and that. Yeah, I think you're wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, now, here, now, and I understand that you, and, and, and we're going to respectfully disagree on this. Let me tell you why I think you were wrong, but why I also understand. I heard this from a lot of people. The interesting thing is, generally, I heard an assessment like that from people who could probably be your grandchildren. I heard a lot of young folks who just were not comfortable voting for either of these candidates, and, and some who actually voted for Trump. Um, and, and so I know that's out there. Here's my argument, and it roots in the book. The people that Donald Trump has empowered are going to quietly do so much damage, so much of it under the radar, that it is my view, it is my view, that they actually move the experiment along. And they, they continue to do incredibly destructive things uh, without much media attention or much media scrutiny. And you know, I'll give you a very good example. Uh, and again, we're going to disagree. And, and I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you're in the front row. But we're going to disagree. Uh, I think there are huge, huge scandals as regards our politics and our governance which often go on with limited attention or no attention whatsoever. I think Donald Trump actually accelerates much of that and has taken crony capitalism to a level that is almost beyond comprehension. Uh, when, he, when Donald Trump did his Charlottesville speech, or his Charlottesville press conference, right? Did anybody notice that Elaine Chow was standing behind him? That was a weird thing, right? You know, I mean, it, it's, yeah, I know she's Mitch McConnell's wife and, and, you know, and that, but she was standing behind Donald Trump throughout, very uncomfortably throughout his rant about racists and non-racists being so much alike and, you know, good people marching with Nazis. And, and many people want to say, well, why was Elaine Chow there? Because it was actually a press conference about infrastructure. And what they were announcing was, and this is like eight days before Hurricane Harvey hit, what they were announcing is they were going to eliminate the Obama era rule titled the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. And they were going to eliminate it because it required that new bridges and roads and hospitals that the federal government invests in have to be built to standards that can with stand storm surges and floods of the sort we are increasingly seeing in an era of climate change. Even right-wingers supported that standard because they said, well, if you're going to spend the money, at least make sure the bridge stays up. The only people that opposed it were real estate developers and folks who are trying to like, you know, get that last condo out on the shoreline, right? And they want the road to it and they don't want to have to have a lot of hoops to jump through. This is grotesque crony capitalism. And if you're right, people are going to rise up and stop it, and we're going to whipsaw over into a much more just and functional future. And I, and I understand it. My fear is that, that there are going to be a lot of bad things that happen on the way, um, and when they are literally ending the standard to make sure that bridges are made to withstand storm surges in the future, that scares me too much to say that, that this is acceptable. And frankly, to be honest with you, 
the actual content of the Charlottesville speech, which was so incredibly divisive and destructive, it may actually lead to a, a rejection of this guy, you know, like something big, and I hope it does, but the fact of the matter is, I keep seeing Paul Ryan and other people facilitate this guy's presidency. And so I fear terribly that we end up with a redefinition of politics, which is Trumpism and then opposition to Trumpism, which is good, but not a defined politics of the future that really is an alternative to this. So we shall see where it ends up. I hope that you come to my next event. Uh, my next book is about the future of the Democratic Party and um, the party takes a bit of a hit. Uh, so thank you for, thanks for that, yes sir. John, you didn't mention, I, yeah. you didn't mention Mike Pence. Oh uh, yes, And, and yes. Um, I'm interested to know what happens to him. You've written quite a lot about impeachment in your columns in The Nation. Uh, does he go out with the bathwater as well and we get Nancy Pelosi or Paul Ryan? Uh, what, what are your predictions? All right, uh, this man is not a relative. Um, and so, and we're, and we're getting up toward our, our time limits here, so I'm going to answer quickly and be glad to talk to people more later on. But the simple fact of the matter is, I have all these people who say, oh, you can't impeach Donald Trump because then Mike Pence will be president of the United States, and he's a more, he's a smoother, more tolerable guy. No, he's not. He's a ridiculous man. Um, he took the vice presidential nomination because he was so unpopular in his own state of Indiana that he was fearful that he wouldn't be reelected. This guy is not good at what he does. So I, I wanna promise you, be comfortable impeaching Trump. It's okay, because Pence, Pence really isn't gonna like storm in and go, yeah, yeah, hey, I, now everybody can be happy. And he's got so much scandal around him. One of the things I write about is that, especially during the transition period, this White House was such a place of, of chaos and uncertainty. Pence was actually in charge of the transition, right? And the fact is he did recommend some of these people. He was also in those rooms where they were saying and doing things that were lawless and irresponsible. And so the fact is, if Trump goes down, it's hard to see how Pence comes through this okay. But I really wanna emphasize, Mike Pence, and I write a lot about him in the book, Mike Pence, is a political careerist who is not good at what he does. He lost a lot of races along the way. He skipped a lot of other races along the way. And the people who work most closely with him never like him. And, and so uh, just be competent. He's not gonna take over and be Jerry Ford. He's not Jerry Ford. Um, this is a, uh, a guy who really is an unappealing figure and his politics are strikingly unappealing. Yes. Hi. Uh, I want to go back to the idea that Congress is not functioning as it's supposed to and it's not this body. And I'm curious how much of that you attribute to, um, you know, the individual members of caucus, uh, members of Congress just playing, you know, the political calculations and how much of it you actually attribute to the gerrymandering that we've sure. seen recently. Excellent question. And um, the, last, the last section of the book, is actually on, on responding to this moment, resistance, uh, the impeachment question. By the way, you know, you can impeach not just presidents and vice presidents, but cabinet members. Um, and I really like the idea of starting with Sessions. But, uh, but uh, there are so many political reforms that we desperately need. Uh, starting with the Electoral College, which, is, which allows us to have unelected presidents, but also I think it's really important to look at, at the dysfunction of Congress. The founders of the American experiment were incredibly imperfect men. For one thing, they were all men. Um, but they, they were incredibly per imperfect figures. But the one thing they, they did fear was a situation where a president might become a king. And so, interestingly enough, the Congress has the ability to impeach the president. The president cannot impeach the Congress. You know what I mean? There's a, it's, so there was clearly a sense that the Congress would ultimately be the policing body, the body that did oversight, budgeting, and in so many ways would, would check and balance a, a presidency. It's not doing that now. And one of the reasons it's not doing that is the gerrymandering. Gerrymandering has gone pro. Um, it's all computerized now. It's, I blame Seattle. <laughs> Technology. And, you know, but it's so professional. It used to be hacks sitting around saying, I'll put that town here and that town here. Now it's gotten so bad 
that you have moved the Republican Party in particular, because it's been so dominant in, in the gerrymandering in recent years, you moved it far, far to the right. It has become a space where there's comfort with, and someone asked me, you asked me about, you know, are there people pulling these strings? It's, it's notable that Breitbart and these far right groupings arose to greater positions of power at a time when congressional primaries rewarded the more extreme, right? And so there is a gaming of this process, and the good news is that there is a case that is coming before the U.S. Supreme Court that was written, amazingly enough, to appeal to Anthony Kennedy, and that seeks for the first time to get the court to rule that gerrymandering denies democracy itself. If they win that case, and it's no guarantee, but if they win that case, we begin what, to my mind, is a very important process of disempowering the Trump administration. And it's, nothing le it's no less than that, because the fact of the matter is, until Congress checks and balances, um, this administration is running roughshod, and the main place they're doing it is there should be congressional committees doing hearings. And I don't mean hearings about, I, I think there should be hearings on Russia and a host of other things, but the fact of the matter is, there should be hearings about drug regulation and about net neutrality and a host of other issues. And we should be, you know, people should be called before Congress. And this shouldn't be about Democrat, Republican. It ought to be, you know, well, that's our basic responsibility. And, and, and I just am so angry with Paul Ryan because he's the Speaker of the House of Representatives and he won't even defend the House of Representatives. He won't even keep it as a functional body. And that is a product of gerrymandering, because if you didn't have so much gerrymandering, you'd have members who had much more independence. So the answer to your question is yes. Well, I um, appreciate all your research about the executive branch, but um, I, my question is about Paul Ryan having gone to high school in Janesville with Russ Feingold, and that is where Paul Ryan is, has you're not, his You're power not from base. Janesville, are you? Well, I lived, unfortunately, lived there for a few years, yeah. In, hey, man, in, we're like homies. Exactly, All right, exactly, thanks for coming. Right. And yeah. because you know so much about Paul Ryan and Wisconsin and Washington, um, my question is about uh, Paul Ryan's, I, I'd like to, I'd love to hear your wisdom about how he passively and yes. actively, strategically abets, but also is there any, do you see any dynamics in the House of Representatives that might dethrone his yeah. fresh-faced, vicious uh, <laughs> agenda. His, athle his athletic horribleness. Um, all right, that is a great question which, to which I could devote the next two hours. However, we have the hook is the hook, just as the hook of impeachment swings nearer and nearer to Donald Trump, the, the hook uh, swings. So let me say, say this to you. I have a chapter in the book on Paul Ryan and I argue that no one is more responsible for Donald Trump being president than Paul Ryan. Because Paul Ryan is indeed fresh-faced, and he's kind of, you know, he looks good on camera to some people. Um, and, and, and he did a horrible thing, and this is something, we need to unlock this and understand how this works in our politics. What Paul Ryan did throughout the 2015-16 campaign was every time Donald Trump did, did something that was unimaginably horrible, like announce he was gonna ban refugees or say something that was unbelievably racially crude or irresponsible or something horrible about immigrants or, well, I think it's a long list. But every time he did that, Paul Ryan would say, well, you know, I wouldn't have said it that way. Which is, by the way, one of the most grotesque things imaginable to say the problem with Trump is he just doesn't know how to spin it, right? He doesn't know how to, to say it. And, and Ryan actually said that a number of times. But the other thing is he would sort of criticize Trump, but at the end of the sentence, he would always say, but if he's our nominee, I will back him. And he has continued to say that as Speaker of the House. So here's the way to understand the role that Paul Ryan plays. This is the Republican Party, right? This is what's acceptable within the Republican Party. What Paul Ryan does every time he says, well, if Donald, you know, I don't agree with Donald Trump, but you know, if he's our nominee, it's okay. If, if he's as president, you know, we're gonna work with him. He expands out the definition of what is acceptable in the Republican Party. So we now have the President of the United States having press conferences where he's saying, oh, you know, Nazis, fascists, supporters of the Confederacy, yeah, there's some fine people marching with them, right? And that, 
Paul Ryan can say all he wants that he doesn't like that, but he, is, he has expanded the definition to, to have room for Donald Trump and Donald Trump saying stuff like that. And so I blame Paul Ryan personally for, and not the people who went to high school with him, uh, but I, I blame Paul Ryan personally and directly for creating the circumstance. It's very different than what Mitch McConnell does. Mitch McConnell is just a total hack. And what Mitch McConnell's doing is just trying to get power and, and get the money in the right places and stuff like that. It's atrocious, but in the case of Ryan, he's using his credibility, what's what the last shreds that are available, um, and a press that is too deferent to him for a variety of reasons uh, to continue to legitimize Trump. It is, it is absolutely atrocious. And the fact of the matter is, you ask what can be done, there are fissures within the Republican Party now. The libertarian right is increasingly concerned about this military industrial complex stuff. So you see people like Justin Amash, uh, Rand Paul, and others. Rand Paul, I think, even as we speak, um, objecting to some of the military budget stuff and really seeking, aligning, right-wing Republicans aligning with Barbara Lee on the, uh, on the authorization and use of military force stuff because they're so afraid of Trump. So you do see some fissures there, but the simple fact of the matter is Paul Ryan will be, will be either disempowered or empowered in November of 2018. And I report to you from my native state of Wisconsin that he is being challenged by Randy Bryce, an iron worker who is an unbelievably effective and appealing candidate. He has a great ad, but I know Randy, and the fact of the matter, Randy's got a primary, respect his opponent in the primary. I think there's a decent chance he's going to be the nominee. And I will tell you something. This guy is driving Ryan nuts already. And the fact of the matter is, southeastern Wisconsin used to send less Aspen to Congress. It used to be a relatively progressive area. It's got a lot of Democratic towns in it. The fact is, I tell you how Paul Ryan is disempowered. If this moment so agitates and energizes people that they come out and vote in November of 2018 at the level that they would in a presidential election or something akin to that, this thing changes. It's real. But one of the things that I, I really emphasize to you is it can't just be against Trump. It has to be, you have to focus on the whole of his administration, all the things they are doing, all the policies. It's got to be a holistic to use a, a term popular in Seattle, um, it, it has to be a holistic vision of opposition. Resistance has to get broader, deeper, stronger. Uh, I think it's possible. In fact, I don't, I'm not casual about this. Now, one last uh, good, great question here. The best I, I don't know which side you're on. Stand up, resist hate. What are you trying to say there? It's simple, John. S stand up, resist hate. I so agree with you. And just remember, I'm the one who knew that Washington had a cabinet of four. <laughs> I defer to you on all questions of substance. I'm really thrilled to know that the Democratic Party is under your microscope for mm -hmm. your next book. Mm -hmm. And to wrap up here tonight, I want you to give us a quick summary, the pitch you get your agent gave to the publisher <laughs> to get the advance for the book, I the Democratic Party, the DNC, the Democrats in Congress are MIA, missing in action. Mm -hmm. What's up with them? I, and and they're, run, they're just holding their breath and saying, we have to win in 2018. And Hillary Clinton, as we speak, is launching her book tour going around America, and because she doesn't have enough money already, she is charging enormous fees at every single one of her public speeches for her new book. Take it away. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I realized I we should have charged more than five bucks for this event tonight, man. Um, but I guess it goes to town hall, so I'm not even getting it, which is really... Unimaginable. Here's my view of the Democratic Party, and I'll say it bluntly, and some people may be uncomfortable with it. I think the Democratic Party has got to become a smart party, and it is not that now. Um, and, and I know people want to have battles between Hillary folks and Bernie folks, and, you know, there's all this stuff. Here's the bottom line of the Democratic Party, and it's the reason 
the, it's one of the many reasons, but a really critical reasons why Donald Trump is president of the United States. I write about this a little bit in the book, but I really am going to examine it in a much deeper way. Look, we are 30 years into a globalization revolution that is changing everything about how we relate to the rest of the world and what we know about the rest of the world. There, there are literally you know, Thai restaurants in rural Kansas. I mean, the world is changing, and, it, and a lot of it's good, but also a lot of it is incredibly jarring. Factories are closing, uh, traditional trade models are, are crumbling, um, and it's a big deal. We are 20 years into a digital revolution that is changing everything about how we relate to one another and how we communicate with one another. And, and the way that I explain this to people is I'd say that for the older folks in this crowd, uh, how many of you have actually seen your grandchild's face in, in recent years? Or have you seen this? <laughs> right? Because we've literally, we have, we've extended the arms of, of all Americans and we've got this phone in front of us and we're constantly living in it. This digital revolution is changing everything about how we communicate, how we function in our lives. Many of you found your way here because you no longer look at maps, you look at your phone. And, and so that's a big deal, it's transformational. It's the equivalent of an industrial revolution. The globalization revolution is, is in fact an industrial revolution. And then finally, we are 10 years into an automation revolution that is going to change everything about how we work. And it is going to divide, it has the potential to divide our society as never before. To literally create an inequality where an awful lot of us are driving, you know, I've, and I've seen this, where the, you're, you're switching back and forth between driving your choice, and you have choices in life, to drive Uber or Lyft. And, and then you go home and you're renting out your back room and your front room, Airbnb, and you're living this gig economy life. It's not gonna work. It's going to, this, the changes that are taking place are overwhelming. The reason Bernie Sanders got as much as 82% of the votes of people under 30 in some states. This is men and women, people of color, people of different backgrounds. Why he did so incredibly well among young people is because they've grown up marinated in this stuff. They actually see the reality. They see the phone, they see the automation, they know where we're heading, and they're scared. Their parents and grandparents are scared too. Their parents and grandparents, some of them displaced from factory jobs into, into warehouse jobs, then displaced by robots in warehouse jobs, literally decided that their best hope was to vote again, right? To say, take me back to something that, that's different from what, what I'm experiencing right now, because I can't afford health care, I can't, I don't have a job, I'm getting displaced, I'm getting lower and lower pay, it's not working. And so, that's how Donald Trump, that's how Donald Trump prevailed. Donald Trump prevailed because the Democratic Party has not been talking about the future. And the Democratic Party has not been saying the changes that are taking place are overwhelming. They have the potential either to massively increase inequality or if we assert ourselves through government and through a genuine humanitarian impulse to potentially create a situation where we work less and yet have stable good lives. Every utopian novel and movie of a hundred years ago told us the future was going to be easy, right? You know, it's like, all right, the machines are going to do all this stuff. We, and then, then, of course, they, then they had the robot movies that scared us. But generally, they told us the future was going to be pretty great. Well, the fact is, the future is a debate. And when the Democratic Party doesn't talk about the future and doesn't say that it is an absolute truism that you're going to have to have single-payer Medicare for all health care because businesses aren't going to provide it anymore, and you're going to have to have affordable housing protections because developers are not going to provide it anymore. And the Democratic Party is going to have to fight against Ben Carson at Housing and Urban Development as Carson and others seek to privatize public housing. And that will be portrayed as an issue of poor people. But it will, in fact, be an issue for middle class people being able to afford housing in our cities. If the Democratic Party doesn't pull the brake and simply say, we can't argue this neoliberal, quasi-austerity, little bit better than the Republicans thing anymore. 
We have to resist Donald Trump because he is a destructive and dangerous man. We have to resist the austerity agenda that his people are putting into place in all of the domestic agencies. And we have to resist war and Pentagon budgets that are so far out of control that they make our country dysfunctional. It takes courage to do that. The Democratic Party has not communicated a sufficiently courageous message. It has not communicated a sufficiently smart message. We are well into the 21st century. We're having a battle for how we define our future. And the fact of the matter is Donald Trump's definition was the word again. It was to take us backward. If the Democratic Party wants to be in that game, it has to talk about the future and talk about a fair and just future. And it has to get comfortable with the reality that Scandinavian social democracy and European social democracy, we may not mirror it in every way, but the fact of the matter is we're going to have to go in that direction, not towards some, as Steve Bannon says, deconstruction of the administrative state. The fact of the matter is we should be taxing the rich more, not less, and we should be building out the functions of government so that we provide health care and housing and a decent life for the future. You know what that will do? It will win votes. Thank you.